I came across a line the other day that stopped me cold. Let me read it to you. Nothing fails like success. While you're turning that around in the back of your mind, let me remind you of something else that made me stop and think for a while. I think it was from the distinguished professor now retired from Columbia University, Dr. Sidney Hook. He said, to the best of my memory, in effect, there's nothing wrong with a little anticipation. The real tragedies in life occur when we get what we want. So let's take these two thoughts as our subjects for the moment. Nothing fails like success. And while there's certainly nothing wrong with anticipation, the real tragedies in life come about when we get what we want. These two statements would seem to run counter to everything we tend to believe, especially in the United States. Let's take them one at a time if that can be done. Nothing fails like success. The uh, quotation is attributed to Gerald Hurd, author of such outstanding books as The Five Ages of Men, The Psychology of Human History, Gabriel and the Creatures, Pain, Sex, and Time, New Outlook on Evolution and the Future of Man and Others. We're recommending that you read The Five Ages of Man, and we're listing his other books in case you'd want to collect all of his works. He's an original and distinguished investigator into the beginnings of our species and why we're the way we are, and incidentally, how we could be a lot better. I found the quotation in another book I'm going to recommend that you read. It's a small paperback written by an educator, Warren Stutzel. The title of the book is School for the Young. Warren Stetzel writes, One of the dangers of evolutionary success is that no matter how well it may have served a creature, any device, if it can be called that, may simply run away, go to extremes, and become the eventual Achilles heel for the species. Such has been the case with fangs and claws, with saber-toothed tigers and mastodons sporting their great giant curling tusks, such is the case now with the trigger-happy response mechanism of the killer whale. Claws and teeth may have their uses, but only up to a certain size. They can, and they do, become unwieldy. A quick response may have its uses, too, but when it must be so quick that the creature has no choices whatsoever, then, as with the killer whale, a creature has been lured down the narrowing passage of too limited response. It's built within itself its own destruction. It is not defense at any cost that has worked. The fossil record is full of those who went that way. Not even success has a very good record as the earth keeps records. Survival in the long, long run has favored the timid, the unfinished, the flexible, the vulnerable. If Darwin was right that the fittest survive, we must add to that statement a more accurate definition of what it is to be fit. To be fit for survival is to be unspecialized. And to remain unspecialized is to refuse the lure of too complete success, the bait of absolute security, the temptation of unbending toughness, the rush to maturity. When I read that part about survival in the long, long run favoring the timid, the unfinished, the flexible, the vulnerable, I couldn't help thinking of the line from Matthew, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Then if survival favors the unfinished, the flexible, the vulnerable, then surely man must be safe. Well, Warren Stetchell goes on to say that he's the youngest of all the creatures, born younger than the chimpanzee or any of the apes. He's their child form. He's wonderfully unspecialized. He has no fangs, no claws, no unfailing built-in reflexes of savage attack or devastating defense. No organ, no power has run away, grown out of size, out of balance. So it would seem. But it may not be so. Voices of serious doubt have been raised. They're not the prophets of doom, but they're sounding a serious warning. Man is out of balance. Man is in danger of specializing. Man is emulating the creatures who failed. And he's doing it with his now most potent organ, his brain. Dr. A.T.W. Simeons calls it man's presumptuous brain. Dr. Simeons is a specialist in psychosomatic disease at the Salvatore Mundi International Hospital in Rome. His book received international acclaim when it appeared in 1961, presenting a theory which explains psychosomatic diseases in terms of evolutionary stresses. It's no doubt common knowledge today that psychosomatic factors are more common than any other in our illnesses and in our deaths, yet they trouble no other species. Even contagious diseases, Dr. Simeon's found, may depend upon psychosomatic factors for their spread. Cholera serves as an example. The microbe which causes cholera is killed almost instantly by acid as strong as normal stomach acid. Cholera, which thrives in the alkaline condition of the small intestine and accomplishes its killing business there, 
should not be able to pass through the acid stomach. But it does. And the reasons are psychosomatic. Fear and panic shut off the flow of acid in the stomach. Those most fearful of the cholera, most fearful of the death it may deal, become its victims. In an Asian epidemic, those too young to understand or too old or wise to panic have the best chance for survival. Millions of years ago, first around the olfactory sense and then later serving the other senses, two new lobes of brain tissue began to develop. Unlike the early reptilian brain to which they were added, they did not control the basic functions of the creature, such things as breathing, digestion, instincts. They had quite another function, and it can be summed up in one word, censorship. They would intercept irrelevant sensory messages. To varying degrees, this new brain development is present in every mammal. It's what we call the cerebral cortex, and in man has grown to be the overwhelmingly predominant part of his brain. To serve well, the new censoring center had to have a memory, and with memory, a system for handling associative processes. The creature had to be able to remember, now that it had moved into the trees, that, ah, yes, that critter used to be a threat, but not now. Of course, it was not really like that, but leave out the language and the sensory message. After it had run through the new censoring center, came out with the same directive. The tree creature could go back to sleep. Eventually, he might not even wake in the first place. The capacity for combining experiences developed. With effective censorship came what we recognize today as the ability to learn. It resulted in conscious perception as against unconscious response. It gave to us, man, the possessors of the supreme censoring center, our memory, power of association, a kind of learning, and reasoning. Now, still intact beneath this giant cortex, a cortex with enough brain tissue in its folds and creases that, if stretched out, it would enclose a barrel, still intact beneath it is the primitive brain stem. And Simeons points out that you could remove the massive cortex, and if the surgery were skillful enough, and if shock were not fatal... The human being would remain alive. Breathing would continue, as would digestion and elimination. The eyes would blink if an object passed too close, but the person would not see what passed before his eyes, and he would not be conscious of his functions. His skeletal muscles would move in response to heat or touch, but the person could not move them. If, however, you were to remove the much smaller brain stem, then, of course, death would be instantaneous. The most important of the divisions of the so-called primitive brain is the diencephalon. Now, how important it was for physical functions, we may have had some notion in the past. But the real inquiry into the diencephalon is just now blooming. Dr. Gene Pfeiffer of the University of Kansas predicts that research concerning the diencephalon is likely to become the major brain research over the next ten years. Why? It's because the diencephalon is the center for all regulatory adjustments. It is in the diencephalon that fear, rage, hunger, sex, and all the other so-called instincts are translated into activity. But one must be asking, haven't we really taken care of these? Certainly all good and responsible people have. Franklin Delano Roosevelt advised us how many years ago that we had nothing to fear but fear itself, and of course he was right. Who goes around being afraid? Rage? Why, only the lunatic rages. Hunger? We have plenty to eat, and anyone can control his appetite. Well, almost anyone. As for sex, it used to be a problem, of course. Or it has just become one, depending on your age and point of view. So why raise all these old matters? Well, the doctor has his reasons. They're making us sick and killing us, that's all. One must wonder why, if the other mammals made the same turn, they are not with us in the psychosomatic bind. Simeon gives his guess at the reason. The other mammals didn't go as far with the cortical excursion as we did. They may have made their mistakes, they may have engaged in their own evolutionary excesses, but they left the cortical one to us. When a smooth working balance was achieved between sensory input, diencephalonic impulse, and censorship's revised interpretation of things, well, further growth of the censoring capacity ceased for the other mammals. They stopped with coordinated cooperation of the system. Again, let's step back a few hundred million years. Back to the reptile in the trees. Simeon sees this tree phase in much the same light as Lauren Isley saw the island, a place of respite, a chance for the most unlikely of creatures to take on the shape of the future. Simmons describes tree life as the life of animated leisure. 
Making one's living was easy. Dinner or supper was never far away, never took long to gain. The old enemies could not reach one. It was an island time, a growth time. And what did the tree creatures do with it? They played. They frolicked, experimented. They developed keener and broader sensory acuity. They practiced and thus developed better nervous control. They improved their coordination. Man's capacity for play was born then and given deep root, and it served him well. The tree creatures, Simeon guesses, played not just when they were young, but throughout a lifetime. The brain grew, and it was a good servant. It was no problem. Not till, using all this play one capacity, man created culture. Not till culture began its rocketing rise in our relatively recent history, that's when the trouble started. That's when the diencephalon and the life-saving cortical sensor began to conflict. Culture demanded new rules, new restrictions, new behavior. Now, that was nothing new, of course, but what was new was that culture came on so fast. This man-made artificial world changed at a rate that the natural world did not, and it asked changes at a rate far beyond what evolutionary processes could achieve. So man launched upon a new use of the sensor, and this is critical. To measure up to his own man-made demands, man turned to a second level of censorship. Now, in the first level, a sensory message was processed and judged in the light of current experience. Its message was recognized. If it warranted action, action ensued. But if it did not, action was denied. The important factor in this process is the impulse. Whether acted upon or denied action, 